FLM, wide open thinking, world-class work, and far-reaching results. Now with locations in Minneapolis, Columbus, Indianapolis, and Washington, D.C. A strategic marketing and communications company dedicated to serving clients who specialize in the business of agriculture and the life of rural communities. For those of you who haven't gone through a farm bill before, and those of you who have, I know there's a lot of veterans here in this room, you know it's complicated. It's a lot of different things you have to understand about the baseline and the scoring and all the different uh, provisions that go into the negotiations when you're trying to cut some of these deals. So as I thought about how we could start out our uh, discussion about the economics that kind of go into a farm bill, I couldn't think of anybody better than a veteran of the last one, uh, Jonathan Coppice, who was a, on the professional staff of the Senate Agriculture Committee during the last farm bill. Uh, Jonathan is now out in the University of Illinois as the director of the Gardner Agricultural Policy Program, and he's also the author of a book that will be coming out about the history of farm bills. So talk about getting into the weeds. Uh, Jonathan has done that with uh, not only uh, his professional experience, but in, now in his uh, role as an author. So please help me welcome Jonathan Coppice. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for having me out and uh, for that introduction. i in the process of trying to put that together, so I promise not to bore too much with history uh, as much as I enjoy it. So, um, yeah, so what about it? We start off our Monday morning with a little baseline discussion. I mean, <laughs> what, can be, what can be better, right? I, uh, I had to worry about what the setup was for me to have to come up and, and do this. I We'll apologize for uh, a couple of PowerPoint slides. I sort of joke as, as an attorney on a, on a department, in a department full of ag economists, they, don't, they keep me tethered. I'm not allowed to go too far anytime numbers are involved without something uh, to keep me uh, moored to the, to the basics. So we'll try to get through this uh, with as little pain as possible. So we do kind of put this into history a little bit. And of course, I borrowed this uh, generously from the incredible work done by Jim Monk and Renee Johnson on the Congressional Research Service, because I can't, I haven't found anybody that sort of summarized what's been happening in the last 25 or so years any better than this, this quick graph. If you think about sort of the history of this, right, the entire process for congressional budget discipline began in 1974. If we pair that up with where farm policy and farm bills are going, 1973 was the uh, big switch from uh, the parity system to the target prices and it's when we brought in the, uh, the old food stamp program, now SNAP. So we changed farm, policy, farm bills pretty specifically and uh, pretty significantly in 1973. Congress changed its whole budget structure really in, in, in 74. So every farm bill after that has uh, kind of had a growing set of challenges with, with budget issues. Um, you think 1981 was written under budget reconciliation cloud, 1990 under budget reconciliation cloud, 1996, and then of course the uh, joys and pains of the last farm bill and the effort to cut spending uh, as we tried to put together a budget or a farm bill that got $23 billion out of that baseline. So it has added a significant amount of, of challenges uh, to kind of pulling that coalition together that you need to write legislation and pass it through the House and Senate. Because once we get into that, that budget discussion, it, it becomes a, a, a tough matter of priorities and, and who, who's taking the cuts and where. So this chart here, going back to 1990, shows you a couple of the major trends uh, that we're seeing. Clearly, uh, the food stamp program, now SNAP, is, is the big item. Uh, nobody can deny that and nobody uh, can miss that. Uh, if you look back into the last farm bill with the, with the recession that hit in 08, of course, our, our participation in SNAP increased drastically. Uh, it peaked about 2013 uh, with around 47, over 47, almost 48 million people were using this program to help uh, buy food for their families and put food on the table. So very important part of the, uh, of the coalition, but a very big part of the farm bill and the farm bill budget. And so we can see how that's trended up over time. On the farm side of the ledger, the, the, the payments, the assistance that go directly to farmers, of course, you can see 
the red bars there, uh, that trend where we saw the, the big increase in the late 1990s uh, going into farm payments, a lot of that, the ad hoc disas uh, disaster assistance, the market loss assistance programs, and then the 2002 Farm Bill. And of course, then you see the crop insurance. I mean, we, we know uh, the, the growing importance of crop insurance, uh, both to farmers, to the industry, uh, but also in the, the Farm Bill baseline, in this, this effort to cobble together the, cobble together the, uh, the coalition and, and move this bill through a difficult process. So you can see that trend here just uh, very clearly between the red, uh, the red sections for Title I and then those blue sections for crop insurance and how much of, a, of an item in that baseline that has become. Now, there's goods and bads to that. Of course, it's a, it's a great program that's a lot of good for farmers. We saw a significant expansion beginning in the year 2000 with the uh, ARPA bill that helped uh, increase uh, the assistance farmers receive for that to, to purchase their, their crop insurance and the increase in revenue coverage and some of those things. Of course, if we're talking budgets, the bad side of that is the larger uh, chunk you make up in the, in the bars up there, the bigger target you become if we're talking about cutting spending. And I think that's the big question that we have going into this, whether we are uh, at the straight baseline that, that, that we think will come out, or are we going to be talking about having to reduce from that, or uh, in the very rare situation when we can add. Um, I think uh, in this era, the only time we've really added spending to the baseline was in 2002, when we had a temporary budget uh, surplus uh, nationally. So that was some of what you see. And then the final, the final trend that is, is uh, important to keep in mind is what has happened with the conservation program. We have seen a steady, albeit you know, not uh, a huge increase in spending, but a very steady increase in conservation spending over time. In fact, the last Farm Bill, the 2014 Farm Bill, was estimated we'd spend more on conservation policy than we would on farm support policy. And so that was a significant change uh, in what we've seen over time. So going forward, if we take just the farm section of this, we can see an indicator of where that baseline might be. Now, you know, not to, I think everybody kind of knows the Congressional Budget Office process. They, they re-estimate, they re-evaluate this. They take a 10-year budget window. They estimate that all the programs that exist today without change, and they estimate what they'll spend out over 10 years. If we're writing a farm bill in 2018, it'll be the, it'll be the CBO estimates for next year that'll come out. CBO just did a re-estimate here in January, which is our most up-to-date kind of guess or uh, insight into where they may be going or where they think the spending items in this bill may be going. And so that's what we're using here. This is not a controlling factor for the Farm Bill next year, but this is kind of our, our uh, most recent shot at, at understanding what they're saying. So you can see the trends uh, continue, right? The blue line at top is our crop insurance spending. Uh, it continues to increase as that program or that, that uh, uh, set of policies continue to grow in popularity and use, and we're covering more and more risk at the farm level for more and more farmers. So that continues to grow. Uh, conservation stays on its relatively steady upward trend. Um, and then the red lines that I've tried to separate out uh, a little bit um, between the two key programs in Title I and the, sub, and the commodity support programs, and that is Arc County, the agriculture risk coverage, the revenue-based assistance we trigger with low prices, low yield situation, and the PLC, or price loss coverage program, which is the, the sort of uh, updated target price countercycle program from the past. And we notice a couple big things that jump out at you on this. The ARC program spending drops significantly and quickly uh, going into the out years into 2020, and we see PLC increasing over that time. So thinking through from a baseline perspective, if this is what it looks like in 2018, this is the money the Congressional Ag Committees, the House and Senate Ag Committees, have available to them to write the Farm Bill. This is what they've got to spend. Any changes require staying within these lines, you know, coloring within these lines, if you will, uh, uh, to, to move forward. A couple of things that show up of, of, of real interest in this most recent estimate is what's happening uh, in the Title I in the red lines. So two things are driving that, that fall off. The first one is CBO is forecasting, like everybody else, that prices will continue in a relatively lower uh, space, right? We've come off of some incredible highs in 2012, in fact, the highest prices we've seen in 2012, and we expect those in CBO and pretty much everybody I've seen forecasting expects those to stay in a lower range. 
The revenue programs use five-year Olympic moving averages. So what happens is when, they, when you have a run of lower prices, it incorporates that into the revenue program, which basically phases out payments in that steady state of a lower set of prices. And so that's what's happening with Arc County. We're readjusting back to the lower price scenario. The prices, the moving market average prices are coming back into sort of a, a, a steady state there going out. Thus, we would expect, and we've been talking to farmers a lot about this, we would expect that payments that they've seen in the last couple of years will be significantly smaller next year, this coming year when they're paid out, and then go to zero pretty quick and actually zero them out in the out years of the, of the, of the baseline. And for the farm management side of that, we remind them that not to count on those payments if you're in an Art County situation because you don't want to incorporate into your, say, your cash rent agreement something that's not going to be there in 2018. So it's, it's an idea that we're trying to adjust that management side of the farm operation to hit where prices are now. Bring down those cash rents. Try to cut your costs a little bit. Uh, the other factor that's really driving that down is the fact that the 2014 Farm Bill, written for five years, the decision between Art County and PLC was a locked-in decision for those five years. Beginning in the 2018 crop year, presuming Congress makes no changes, farmers will have the option to reevaluate that decision and make a change. CBO is estimating that while we had about 96, 97 percent of corn and soybean base acres in the revenue program in our county, CBO is estimating about 83 percent of the corn acres will switch into PLC. So that's shifting a lot of that potential spending out into the PLC program uh, and out of ARC. We think about uh, CBO is estimating about 50 percent of soybean acres make that switch as well. And that's going to drive their estimates of spending under that program, and you see that uh, jump up as we go. So what does this mean for the next farm bill besides how much money we have to spend? Um, well, kind of about everything, right? Because the budgeting process and how we sort through that is the entire effort anymore of trying to cobble this thing together and write legislation that works. So I took the, the previous uh, uh, line graph when we switched to a bar here to, to look at this in a different way. Um, the main issue when we think about the, the baseline and what this, what this means for farm bill process and writing is it creates this zero-sum game, right? The budget discipline process is a prioritization mechanism, right? Which, which items, which things do we want to put priorities in and continue spending, and where are we going to cut? The zero-sum game, right, is that we have this much money available to us. If you want to spend more somewhere here, you've got to cut somewhere else. And that's been the budget rules that we've operated under for a long time, that you have to offset any increases in spending. Presuming that we're not touching SNAP in that process based on the politics of doing so, I have, again, just focused on the three main buckets for the farm side of the, uh, the ledger, the crop insurance, Title I, and, and Title II conservation. So you can think of it this way. If you want to increase any one of the colors in that scheme, and you can see I tried to break out PLC and ARC, although it didn't show up as well on this as I kind of hope, but you can see the, the change from ARC to PLC in that. But if you want to increase spending in any part of that, you're going to have to take it out of somewhere else. And that's what really sets up this difficult political situation because my priority may not be your priority, and thus if you're cutting my priority, we got a problem, and we got to cobble together 218 votes in the House and 60 of them in the Senate. So somehow you've got to bring that coalition together around the spending items. And that's the basic effort that we, we see coming uh, down the road or coming uh, before us uh, with the CBO baseline. That we're going to have to, the committees are going to have to find a way to work through policy changes. So we talk about the lower price scenario and how that's challenging farmers. We talk about issues with various commodities and programs, uh, dairy, cotton, uh, as well as uh, interest in conservation title spending and changes to that. If you remember the last Farm Bill cut conservation by about $6 billion estimated over time, and a lot of that came out of the CRP program as we stepped down the acres in CRP to 24 million acres, which is right where we're at today. Any of those changes, pushing up CRP acres, will require spending to offset it. Bringing in new commodities or changing the way the commodity programs work will require offset somewhere to spend it. And we get in that collision of interest then as we get at the, uh, at the table in the, in the committees and then out on the floor then as we start working to bring votes together and cobble together the, base, the, uh, the coalition that we need to pass, which like I said, we've, 
we've seen succeed most of the time, uh, even since this discipline process was put in place in 74, but is increasingly uh, added to the challenges for the committees and for the farm bill writing process. So with that, that should be enough torture. I think, did you want to do questions? And yeah. <clears throat> it should be enough baseline torture for one more. I appreciate the patience and tolerance of that. So our team is going to be walking around the room. If you have a question, please uh, fill it out on the card and uh, raise your hand so they can pick that up, and we'll we'll get started. I'm gonna I'm just gonna lead lead off here, and if you want to grab, uh, I think they're already on. But uh, so one of the things that has been referenced is that we do have to work within the baseline that you've talked about, but there has been a precedent in previous farm bills. Uh, where there's been the ability to bring in some more money. What are the odds, as we look at 2018, that we can actually go find those dollars that uh, may be needed to address the priorities that so many different groups have? I hate to be, a, I hate to be setting odds this early in the, uh, <laughs> in the process, uh, as long as I'm not the house holding the, the book on that one. Um, the, I think the odds are difficult based on where the discussions have been. Now, we've certainly seen uh, a budget, uh, a skinny budget or whatever from the administration that looks at cutting spending, although not specifically in these programs, although unfortunately in some important areas like research and extension work that we do. Um, that's a shameless uh, plug for universities. Um, <clears throat> but so I think it's a challenge because I think a lot of this discussion has not been about uh, expanding that baseline um, finding more funding, even with the, the, the issues we have seen at the farm level and farm finances. Again, the, the big example of when that happened was when we had a budget surplus in 2002. And so we're not seeing that in the federal, the big federal picture. And then the other thing I would kind of maybe add to that is sometimes we can get too wrapped around the baseline and not overly, and not focus enough on some of the policy changes that we need. And so if there is a way to work on the policy that is not solely at, the, at trying to move a baseline number, but makes certain that, that that safety net and that system that we have out there works for farmers and that we think maybe in some creative ways that we haven't thought before about how some of these titles work and what farmers are needing on the ground. Uh, we could, there's, there's always room for more creativity, I think, than, than maybe even pushing baseline numbers up, but that's no small set of challenges in it. So you're suggest if we stay focused on the goal and the need rather than just the numbers when we start out, that's kind of where you're focusing yeah. on? Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think it gets challenging if you're asking for funding, right? I mean, I, that, that's sort of intuitive in this day and age and what we've seen. And so the, the focus on how these things work and what farmers need and why uh, is, is usually the one that seems to resonate better, that, that you know, the food security uh, concerns, the challenges that have happened with, with changes in, in market situation and, and just kind of working those through and thinking about how you wrap your policy, how, you, how do you design the programs in that mindset versus I need five billion more here. Because I, I think that just gets us deeper into this, uh, the politics of it and the challenge of, well, who's going to pay for my ask? Mm -hmm. So we've got some questions that are coming in from the audience here. Uh, this is a topic that I'm sure we're going to hear probably not only in our conservation panel, but when Congressman Peterson gets here. There's been talk about increasing the Conservation Reserve Program, the number of acres. As you know, in the last Farm Bill, the cap was reduced substantially with a big, a big chunk of savings associated with bringing the, uh, the maximum enrollment down. So what would it cost to go up again uh, another 10 million acres? What if we keep that cap going back up, maybe not to 36, but what if we have a dramatic increase, as some have suggested? What kind of costs are we talking about? So major caveat, I haven't seen any scores on exactly what that would look like. So I, you know, of course, what CBL do will estimate any of those changes against that baseline and estimate how much more it'll cost. So I, I do not know uh, personally where they might estimate, you know, where they may push that to. Um, but you're talking about large amounts of money, um, you know, billions in the 10-year uh, uh, baseline estimate is, is likely. 
And, you know, that, like you said, with the last farm bill, we stepped down CRP to achieve some of the six billion, a large, actually a large percentage of the six billion in savings that came out of the conservation title of that bill. And so, you know, that was at a time in high prices. Now we have lower prices. We're seeing the push to go the other way. But again, we're, we're stubbing, we're running into stubbing our toes on that issue that it's going to have to pull from somewhere uh, to do so unless we can find uh, a way to work within that program that may not, you know, again, we, we're using county average rental rates, which have been really high, for example, in many places. How do we think about the Conservation Reserve Program as not just the acres we want into it, but how the program is designed and working? Uh, so that if you want to expand, you can also look at changes that would be less expensive or some other creative ways to get some of the same benefits. That, that's where I think a lot of that challenge comes uh, because I think just flat out adding another chunk of acres is going to be very expensive and very difficult. Now, there are a couple questions regarding SNAP or the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. I know we get wrapped around a lot, a lot of acronyms uh, <laughs> during farm bill discussions, but... Uh, questioners want to know, what do you see happening with the baseline for SNAP? And then I'll ask you the second part of that. So the, uh, the baseline for SNAP is coming down. Uh, participation, so we peaked at uh, 47, almost 48 million around 2013. I think last year's numbers were down to 44, and I think we're seeing it come down into the, the high 30s. So that will bring the SNAP baseline down. It will still make up the largest percentage of farm bill spending uh, that, that's, that's in the, the baseline. But it has come down and it, it will continue to do so as we see higher employment. Um, remember that SNAP is, is countercyclical in its own right. When the economy's bad, when, when, when the people have lost their jobs or, or are working part time or, or have picked up you know, uh, just something that isn't, you know, isn't their career type job, that they, they struggle then to put food on the table and this is a program that brings them assistance to do that. And so it is countercyclical when that economy went down in 2008, the spending, the participation went up. We've seen the, the improvement in the unemployment numbers. That is driving down the cost. But it is still going to be a very large program uh, in the baseline that will likely attract attention if we're talking about cutting spending. And as we saw in the last farm bill process, particularly in the House, uh, those fights around SNAP can be uh, very damaging to the ability to get your votes in the center. You may not ever appease the far rights or lefts of the, of the political spectrum, but to find that, that center group, that center coalition to hold it all together, um, the snap fights tend to unravel things. So um, we well, expect that, that to be hopefully not a repeat of that effort. Well, that's a great segue to the next question is, why not split SNAP and nutrition from, from the farm part of the farm <laughs> bill? Um, because as you referenced, that is what happened. Yeah, so, um, so one of the great things that I've gotten to do at the University of Illinois is bore undergrad students with history uh, and legislation and policy making. You know, nothing like a 20, 21 year old that you try to explain congressional process to. And they, it takes a while. But we always start with I said, look, we have, one, we have one rule in legislation. There's a first and last rule of whatever we do, and it's count the votes. And that is why we talk about SNAP and the coalition. You have to have 218 votes in the House and 60 in the Senate. Barring something completely different in, our, uh, in the way our congressional processes work, you need that coalition to bring that many votes to the table who want to uh, see the bill pass. So if you think you've got 40-some million people in SNAP, uh, FSA will tell you that we make 1.7 million ARC and PLC payments to ARC and PLC farms. That's not farmers, those are farms. Most farmers have multiple FSA farms in their operation. There's 1.7 million versus 44 million. So I think the vote counting aspect of this is what, what it really gets down to. That, and you know, we talk about the mandatory baselines a lot. There's a huge bill that brings in interest across the spectrum on, on a lot of things. So it's not just SNAP and, and farm programs and conservation and crop insurance. I mean, all that we do on international food aid and, and rural economic development and, of course, the research title and extension and things like that that really are valuable across the board bring in people who can find an interest in the bill that you know, may not represent a farm district. Uh, there's a lot fewer of those districts out there now than there have been in the past. And I think we're talking, <clears throat> excuse me, 33 that are farming dependent districts, 35, depending on how you depending do how the you math. Count it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
So someone wanted to know <laughs> about um, what do you see happening with Title I programs? Or do we still need that part of the safety net as much as we ever did, given that the farm economic conditions are certainly not as good as they were going into 2012 and 2013? What's the future there? And that's, I mean, that's, uh, that's, the, that's one of the big questions. Is what do farmers need? We've, had, we've been having conversations with farmers uh, about what, it, what their priorities are. How do you think about managing your farm through this process, through a lower price environment, with some of the other challenges you have? And it's, it's risk, uh, the, the weather risk, and, and, and the in-year, in-crop year market risk that are so important for crop insurance to cover. But we're seeing that multi-year price that lower price scenario, which is, oh, sorry, which is, uh, which is adding uh, weight and interest in how Title I helps and why we need it. And so do farmers need Title I? You know, some of them will tell you they do, some of them will tell you they don't. And, but I think overall we've seen, I mean, if you go back and think about, again, the history of the 84 years we've been working to try to help farmers through the risk scenarios they have, particularly the market side of it. So, that's a long track record for something that isn't needed, right? So there's a reason why we've been doing this. I think what we come back to time and again is how best to design this, given what is changing in farming, given the, the different management aspects of farming we see today, given the different challenges we see internationally, as, as was mentioned, um, and, and, and the way, you know, if you think about some of the industries that have moved and, and, um, and how the markets have changed around uh, prices, what do farmers, need to see in order to get into the bank to get your operating loan. You know, one of the things we always sort of try to remind is that when you put the seed in the ground in the spring, you're sinking cost into the, into the dirt, and you're hoping that it comes back in a crop that you can sell, right? And that is a, that's a big risk. And so to be able to go into the banker and to be able to make the budgets work on your farm are important, and these programs help back that up. Now, how we design them is, is is a bigger question. And what does the design need to look like for farmers? And, um, you know, I, we're still hearing a lot of opinions, a lot of thinking going on that. And I think that's one of the great things about a process like this. It takes time and it gives the chance for various groups to talk and, and work through uh, all the aspects they need. So a question here wants to know about the reference that um, Chuck had made to being united in agriculture and the importance of that in terms of fending off attacks. What kinds of messages do you see as someone who has <clears throat> worked on Capitol Hill, worked on the committee staff, what, what messages do you see that are effective in conveying the importance of farm programs and preventing those kinds of attacks that we have perennially seen in recent years against farm bills? Well, I cannot at all argue with, uh, with Mr. Connor about um, the importance of, uh, of a unified front. There's not some, I mean, we saw in the last Farm Bill some of that intra-ag coalitional dispute. Uh, that makes it challenging because if you're not interested in farm programs or policy and the farm guys are fighting each other, then, you know, it raises a lot of questions. So I think that's one aspect, the united front of it. And I think the other one that we can see uh, and we've seen instances of uh, th throughout history is the thing that can offset or upset that balance then is, is that give and take amongst that coalition. And if you've got one, one group pushing too hard one way or one group pushing too hard the other way, it can split apart and kind of split apart that smaller coalition that, that's um, so vital to getting the bill written and getting out of the floor. Uh, and so it is not just a, we all gotta get along. I mean, it is an all, we all gotta get along and find a way that nobody's, you know, nobody's sort of taking more from one or pushing too far that we, we get into this situation where you just lose that, that vital kind of central part of, of, the, of the coalition. So it, it's, a, it's no small balancing act. But I think these types of conversations, uh, the conversation that farmers are having is, are fascinating. Uh, what they're working through and how they're working through uh, their budgets and their concerns and trying to sort through not just what it means in Illinois, but what does it mean nationally? What are we seeing in other parts of the country and why? And so the, you see the groups getting together, the commodity groups, the Farm Bureau, the, the major groups that is trying to you know, wrestle with this. When they, so when they come up to the committee, it helps to hear a more unified voice. It helps a lot to hear a more unified voice because then we're not engaged in trying to sort that out. But um, that's, that's going to be a big challenge. 
Thank you. And really, that underlines the reason for having the summit, right? To have these discussions as we're going into the debate so that we can surface a lot of the different issues and help others understand and educate about the process. Um, this isn't directly in your wheelhouse, but <coughs> excuse me. So someone, I can dodge. <laughs> some, someone asked about trade policy, and certainly that's been generating a lot of headlines lately as we've watched the President Trump and the new administration. Uh, back out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, ask about renegotiating NAFTA, uh, focus on bilaterals. Uh, how do you see the interactive uh, interaction between trade policy and the ability for the farm economy to prosper or not? Well, trade is just absolutely vital. Uh, and there's the ability to export our products. We produce more of these major commodities than we can ever use in this country. And so they, the ability for export markets to, to take uh, the products that we make and that we produce and, and, and send that money back into uh, the rural economy and to farmers is, uh, is just vital. And I think, you know, getting, stepping aside from, uh, from specific trade deals or, or, or bilaterals or whatever that might be, I think the challenge that we see and the concerns that we're hearing a lot uh, with farmers who who watch this and talk about it is this sort of ripple effect that can happen. I mean, it may not be pulling out of the TPP, but it's what it sends, the signal it sends to the rest of the world and how do they begin looking at America as a reliable supplier of the commodities that are needed. So it's, you know, China has been a huge buyer of soybeans and they have, that market has benefited greatly from that. What happens if, not that we have a trade war, even something so drastic, but what happens if we ripple effect through that where we begin to look less and less like the reliable supplier and investments go elsewhere for infrastructure to move soybeans out of other countries so that they, are, they feel more secure because we, every country needs that food security. And so the thing that we hear uh, some farmers talking about and, we, and we've talked a lot about is just the concern that, that you, can, you can do great damage on this front even without trade wars and other things. And so, how do we continue to make sure we reassure the world that we are the reliable supplier that we've been and that we can continue to be and that the rest of these things can be worked out as, as we go? Thank you. So last question, and, and we'll wrap up here. You talked about increased conservation spending. Uh, didn't really break that out between conservation retirement programs and yeah. working lands programs. Um, <laughs> You know, we've, we've spent a lot of money over the years trying to prevent soil erosion and, you know, dating back to the Dust Bowl days and all that sort of thing. How do you see the mix going forward? And I know we're going to talk about this because we have a whole conservation panel, but how do you see the mix of funding going forward? Yeah, I took that out when I saw you had Dave and Tina coming up the tide, and <laughs> I, w I didn't want to get beat up too bad. Um, so the big thing you see in the baseline on the, on the conservation title, and I'll sort of stick to that, is the bulk of the funds, while we have cut spending in CRP, that is still the largest spending item in the Title II baseline. It's flat. It's relatively uh, stable because of we've capped it at 24 million acres. But it still makes up the biggest uh, dollar amount of spending. Um, CSP, the Conservation Stewardship Program, has been slightly increasing. EQIP has increased. So what we've seen from a policy and even in the budget side as a trend has been a shift to the working lands. And, and I mean, that was most dramatically done in the last farm bills. We reduced CRP in a time of high prices and the funding for CSP and EQIP and, some, and RCP, the new uh, regional program. Uh, so we saw that trend shift. So are we seeing the reversal and then how, how does that play out within it? Um, I'll gladly hand that off to, uh, to, another, to another panel because um, I, I don't know, I, I, you know that, that gets to be a very tough set of priorities to work through, but, but we've certainly seen uh, a slight trend in that, in that direction towards working lands in the last few bills, and whether this new price environment changes that and how, I think is one of the big questions that have to be, uh, have to be wrestled through. All right, thank you. Well, Please thank join you. me in, welcome, in thanking Jonathan for all his comments. <laughs>